Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We have been in a series, Grow Down, right? Our desire uh, as faithful followers of Christ to grow down in our understanding of the Word of God and its truth. Uh, and this is so important to us, you know, because the deeper we get into God's Word, the more it's going to help us out in our daily practical way of living life. And uh, so we have learned a great deal so far uh, in this series so far as we've jumped out to it to kind of catch you up for those of you that may be new here as a guest or for those of you that just kind of forgot where we've been. Let me give you a brief kind of synopsis of what we've covered so far. Well, we looked really quickly about who wrote this letter. It was Paul, the Apostle Paul. He wrote it to the church at Colossae, but he'd never actually been there. And so he had a guy named Epaphras who was the one who started and founded the church at Colossae. And he said, you know what? I desire to really keep the church going the way that we should faithfully to the Lord and to his word. And so there was uh, some doctrine, some false doctrine that was going around in the, in the regions around Colossae. And uh, Epaphras wanted to protect the church and so he sent uh, he went and visited Paul uh, while he was in prison at Rome and at this point uh, Paul had been in prison for about four years some in Caesarea and then now in Rome where he is currently at as we read this uh, passage of scripture and where we're at in the letter to the church at Colossae and so he got this Epaphras got this letter and then was taking it back to the church uh, to be really an encouragement for them, to, to be a, something to lift them up and to encourage them to stay faithful and true to the truth of God's word. And so as we've been diving into this series so far, we've really noticed a lot about uh, this letter. Really, we're going to notice when we look at the whole of it that Paul broke it down into two sections. Uh, the first is chapters 1 and 2. The second is three and four. Uh, chapters one and two is all about theology. Uh, all, all about knowing and understanding God's word of who he is. Uh, and then the second part of it is very practical. It's now knowing who God is and now here's what you're supposed to do about it. And so when Paul started off this letter, he started off by writing really how thankful he was about hearing about this church. This church that was striving to be faithful to Jesus Christ. And he encouraged them in their faithfulness. Uh, he encouraged them to let them know that he was grateful for the faithfulness of the church he was very thankful uh, not only that but for what God was doing through them to the people in the world uh, and how they were receiving the word of God how they were ministering and, and, and taking the word of God out to the nations and so it was a blessing for Paul to be able to write this work he was very thankful secondly we looked at in our second opportunity to study this together is we looked at what he prayed for and how he prayed for the church at Colossae. Well, there were two main things that he really desired to do. One, he said how he was praying. He was praying unceasingly. In other words, whenever they came to his mind, he began lifting them up to the Lord. And then the second thing was what he was praying for. And what he was praying for was he was praying for spiritual growth for the body of believers. Uh, today, friends, that's great things to pray for, right? One is to pray whenever we can, and two is to pray for each other that we would be strengthened in the word of God that we would grow deep in our understanding and our faithfulness to God well how do we do that why do we do that well we do that because of who he is right that was the third lesson that we learned was studying who he was the preeminent one right this big term that means that he is to take first place in our lives well why because he is the creator he is the creator of the universe he is the son of God he is the one who has done great and mighty things he is the one who continues to do great and mighty things he's the sustainer we talked about that he did all of this with a purpose why so he could reconcile us in last week's lesson that we learned to reconcile us to God because of who he is he is the only one who can make us right before God above in heaven and so it's a great thing to think about how we are reconciled by God not by by anything that we do but solely by everything that he has done God makes us right before him and that's amazing to think about this morning right amen Amen. Well, as you have your word, we're going to be looking this morning at really a two-part little mini-series in this entire grow-down desire for our lives. Because Paul really starts to write about kind of some things that have happened to him and some things that he's dealing with with the churches. And so he really, we start to see kind of a sense that he is struggling for the saints. And so this is kind of the first part of that series, the struggle for the saints that we have. And really what he's going to be talking about today and what we're going to be diving into is really the mystery 
mystery. The mystery of what he lists in the scripture and what in the world that actually means. So if you have your Bibles, Colossians chapter 1, we're going to be looking here right now at verses 19, or sorry, verses 23 all the way to 29. Now verse 23 we did cover last week, uh, but we're going to kind of briefly mention it and kind of get a little bit of context to help us with where we're going in the passage today, all right? So verse 23 says this in Colossians chapter 1. Paul said, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known what great, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is what? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28 tells us, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Verse 29, then Paul said it this way as he struggled for the saints. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you right now for this moment to be in this place, to be online, even those for who are watching, to be able to open up your word, to be able to discover what you want to reveal to our hearts today. And Lord God, we thank you for the mystery that you have revealed here in the text of scripture in the New Testament. And God, I pray that you be with us as we grow in our understanding of what that mystery is. And God, how more fully we can serve you as faithful ministers of the gospel of Christ. And so Jesus, to you be all the glory and the praise and the honor as we open up your word, God. May it illuminate our hearts today as we seek to grow in our relationship with you. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, Rich Chris, as we think about this text, I think really how we can learn from Paul's ministry to those saints and to the saints that he was dealing with and really learn what the mystery is all about and how it has been revealed to all those who can see and understand the word of God. Well, as a part of that, I know that we are all called, like Paul was called, to be ministers of God. And so today, I've broken this down into really, in this text, six main points. So you're going to have to stick with me this morning, but I think it's going to help to really show us who we are in Jesus Christ. The first is this, is that we are ministers chosen by God. At the very end of verse 23, Paul mentioned this, right? He mentioned how he was a minister of the hope of the gospel. Verse 23 said this, "...in of which I, Paul, became a minister." Not only there, but we're going to fast forward a little bit into verse 25. In the very beginning of verse 25, he also reiterated this same statement. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. Paul was a minister who was selected by God to serve God's people. Paul, however, did not plan on this happening in this way. The Bible tells us a lot about Paul, right? Many of us can read the the work of the Acts of the Apostles and the book of Acts written by Luke, and we can see a lot about the life of Paul. We know that he was originally named Saul. In Hebrew, that is the word Shaul. It means asked for or prayed for. And I can guarantee you this, that he did not ask or pray for what happened to him. This did not take place in the life of Saul, known as Paul. Saul, according to himself, even put it this way in Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, who he was. He said he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness, under the law, blameless. This is a little bit about who Saul was. Saul was a man that really had it all, if you would like to say that, in the way of who he was as a disciple of God. He was educated after the all, after Gamaliel, Acts chapter 22, verse 3 says that, who was a wise teacher in the Jewish culture in that day and age. If you would put it this way, he was top of his class. 
He told the church of Galatia this in Galatians chapter 1 verse 14. He said, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own uh, age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Saul, however, we know what kind of happened with him. He was in favor at that time period of killing Christians. He watched, we know, as Stephen, the first martyr for the gospel of Christ, was martyred as he was stoned to death. We know that the people who were stoning him laid their garments at the feet of Stephen, who approved of his execution. We learn a lot about this Saul Paul character, and we learn about Saul and his really desire for those who were Christians. Acts chapter 8 verse 3 tells us this, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. I can tell you this right now, it was not in Saul's five-year plan to convert to Christianity instead of killing Christians, leading them and people in this world to Jesus Christ. But friends, when God steps up and moves, great things happen, amen? I look around the room and I think about many of you who could give testimony about where you were and how your life was without Christ. And now when God stepped in, he transformed everything about it. Why? Because we've been ministers that have been called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You think about Paul and where he was headed, but yet God had a plan for his life. Friends, we're all called, I believe, to be ministers of the gospel of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word minister in this text that we see here in this text is actually in the Greek, the word diakonos. It means one who executes the commands of another. It's a servant. It's a slave. It's a minister. Now, the term minister, I believe, has been misapplied throughout the ages by countless people. Rich Chris, I know that our ministerial staff bears the title of a minister. But friends, let me tell you this this morning you do as well. The only difference is, is that you've chosen to employ us as lead ministers who have been ordained in the church. For we are all called to be ministers of Christ Jesus. After all, we are all called, are we not, to execute the commands of our Lord and Savior because we are slaves to him? Listen to what Paul told the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 6, verse 22, he said this, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. Praise God, we gave up the old sinful life and we said, God, I want the spiritual life in you and have a relationship with you that I know exactly where I'm going to spend my eternity with you in heaven. It's an amazing thing to think about. But Ridgecrest, yes, there are ministers who are called deacons. And yes, there are ministers who are called elders and pastors and overseers. But hear me today, if you have expressed faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you are a minister of God today. You're chosen of God to serve him and to bring him glory and to bring him honor thought about this this week as I heard my kids as my wife is teaching them scripture memory as a part of their homeschool and they were working on 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 and it's one of my favorite texts of scriptures because it reminds us as ministers of God what we're supposed to be doing and Paul told this to the church at Corinth so whether you eat or whatever you drink or whatever you do you do all to the glory of God that's our calling in this life why because we are ministers of God chosen by God. Secondly, if you're taking notes, verse 24 tells us that we are also ministers through suffering. Verse 24, we put it this way, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Now we know at this point again, I reiterated a little moment, a few moments ago, I kind of said it moments ago about this, that Paul was in prison at this very time that he was writing this text. Paul could rejoice though because he knew of what Christ had endured for the sake of all those in this world. He knew that he could endure and press on and rejoice in his sufferings because of what Christ suffered on the cross. The author of the Hebrews put it this way, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. How Jesus joyfully entered and approached suffering because he looked around and knew that his suffering would cause an opportunity for anyone who believes to have a relationship with God today. What an opportunity for us to understand how we can rejoice in suffering. 
We can rejoice in suffering knowing that God can strengthen us and help us as we desire to serve him faithfully in what he's called us to be as ministers of God. You know, Paul told the church at Corinth about how his suffering and how he endured, but yet he did not let it impact his ministry for Christ. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. He said, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're, per we're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but watch this. We are not destroyed. Friends, he had the power to endure to stay strong, to rejoice in his suffering. You know, I think about this when Paul then said it this way in verse 24 as he continued with this thought process. He said, and in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Now throughout the ages, this verse has been taken out of context time and time again. Some have thought that this passage meant that Christ's suffering was not enough to take away all of our sins when he died on the cross. And some have taken this statement to mean that Christ's followers must make up for what Christ's suffering did not atone for. In other words, we must suffer and die to atone for some of our sins because Christ's sacrifice was not enough. Now, of course, this is incorrect. This is not what the Bible teaches us. After all, we just finished last week speaking about reconciliation, right? And how God is the one that reconciles man to himself. And that we have no part to play in that process of God reconciling man to himself. Friends, the Bible is clear about this, that we do nothing to save ourselves. It is Jesus Christ alone that saves us. Listen to what he told the church of Rome, Paul did. Paul said, for the death that he, Jesus, died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In other words, Jesus gave his very life to cover all of the sins of this world. Not just some, and that you have to do something on your own part to cover the rest that he couldn't cover. Friends, Jesus died and his death was all that was needed to atone for every single sin that ever exists or will exist. Amen for that. Friends, salvation comes from the God who is the giver of grace. It's nothing by which we do. Paul told this to the church at Ephesus, right? He wanted them to make sure they understood they could do nothing to earn their salvation. It was all by the grace of God. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone can boast. The reason that God does all the saving work was because if we could do all the saving work, we don't need God. We are God. And so he says, no, that's not how it works. Jesus Christ and his death alone was what was needed. Now, what does it mean then when Paul says this in verse 24? And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Well, here's what I believe. I believe what he was doing was he was speaking about the persecution that he had to endure, much of which came from physical pain and even emotional and verbal abuse. He experienced pain and hostility because why? He was standing up for Jesus Christ and he was standing up for the church. So when Paul spoke about filling up what was lacking in Christ's affliction, he was speaking about how people shifted their persecution away from the risen Savior to now put all the persecution on the living saints. That's what he's speaking about here in the text. So the persecution moved away from Jesus because he had been dead, buried, risen, and he was in heaven with God. He wasn't there anymore. So the people shift their persecution. Instead of persecuting Jesus, they're like, let's get his followers. Let's go after them. Hear me today, if you are a living servant of Christ, you are going to experience some form of persecution. It's going to happen. Paul told Timothy this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. He said, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, watch this, will be persecuted. It's going to happen. Ministers, servants, we are chosen by God and we will go through times of suffering. But friends, hear me today. We are not alone as we go through those times of suffering. You know what can encourage us? Is the very next statement that we see in this text that we are also ministers of the word of God. 
Think about this as we already saw how Paul was chosen of God to be a minister. Now we notice and see what he was a minister of and what we are ministers of. Verse 25, he continued and said this, to make the word of God fully known. You know, as ministers of Christ, our job is to make the word of God fully known. Now hear me today, this was not a new concept that Paul was introducing to the church at Colossae. Some of the people that were believers at that church were Jewish believers and they would have understood their call to continually make the name of God known to all peoples. Listen to what David sung out as he placed the ark of God in the tent. He had Asaph and his brothers and him as well sing out this song in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8. He said, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Rich Chris, we must never forget our calling to tell the world about the greatness of God. But how can we accomplish that task? How can we be effective ministers of the word? I've got three little things here that may help you as you desire to be an effective minister of the word of God. First, let me encourage you to make the word of God a priority in your life. You know, when Paul came to saving faith in Jesus Christ and he was converted, he left what he knew and he embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter one that he spent three years in the Arabian desert studying and preparing for the gospel and what God had won him to do as a mission to the people in this world. Now listen, I'm not saying to go and spend three years in isolation. It's not what I'm saying here in the text. But what I'm saying here is I believe we need to understand our calling to know the word of God so that we can effectively share the word of God. It's important to know what you have so that you can share it the way that you're supposed to share it. You know, a few years ago, an elderly woman, this is a true story, was moving from her home in France. She decided to move, and so she needed some help with getting rid of some things before she was moving. So she called in an auction house to come and list the things that she could sell so that she could sell them and not take them in the move. As the auction house person was walking throughout the house, they noticed a painting that was hanging over her stove, over her oven. They took the painting down and realized it was a painting from the 13th century by an Italian painter, and it was entitled Christ Mocked. Here's the picture on the screen. The painting turned out to be extremely rare and valuable. There's only 11 paintings in the entire world from this guy that remains, and he's seen as one of the early painters in all history, in this time of history. The painting in 2019 sold for $26.8 million. She didn't even know what she had hanging right over her oven. Friends, hear me today. We have access to the word of God, which is, contains the most valuable information that has ever existed on this planet. But what do we do with that valuable possession that we have? Do we keep it to ourselves or do we share it with those who are in desperate need? We need to know what we have right in front of us to make it a priority in our lives. Second, we also need to remember the word of God changes us. When we read it, when we study it, when we apply it to our lives, it radically changes us. You think about this, even the life of Saul and how it radically changes his life. When we obey the word, great things happen in our lives. We become closer to God. We become more compassionate people. We even find joy in the craziest things because we have a great God and King that is there for us all the time. I thought about how we find joy in the craziest things. This past week I heard a funny joke and it was really a dumb joke, but I couldn't keep, stop from laughing. So I figured I'd share you with how joyful things can make you. I heard a story about two cows that were standing in a field. The first cow looked over to the second cow and said, have you heard about this terrible mad cow disease? It makes cows go completely crazy and then they die. The second cow then replied to the first cow, it's a good thing I'm a helicopter. Joy and all the craziest things that exist. Why? Because we have an understanding of who God is and what he's done in our lives. We can find pleasure in all types of things. Praise God. We make the word of God a priority. We remember it changes us into who we should be. Thirdly, I'd also encourage you this, is if you want to be a faithful minister of the word of God, you need to also share the word of God. You need to speak it. In order to be a faithful minister of God, we've got to do something with the word that's changed us. 
We've got to take it and tell others about how it can help change their lives as well. In Romans chapter 10, Paul said this to the church at Rome in verse 14. He said, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The word preaching in that verse in Romans chapter 10 verse 14 is also the word proclaiming. In other words, we have got to speak the word of God so that people can hear the word of God and let it impact their heart and life just like God did for us as well. You know, Jesus even expressed this in his desire in the Great Commission to make disciples of all the nations. How does that happen? It happens when we share and speak the word of God. Well, how does this occur? Well, it's because we've got to recognize who we are. We're ministers chosen by God. We're ministers through suffering. We're ministers of the word, but we're also mis ministers of the mystery today. Look at verse 26 and 27. He says, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise the Lord for his perfect timing. At the right time, God decided to reveal what was once hidden now becomes open for the people to see and understand. Now, Paul loved this term, mystery. He and John are the only people who use it in the New Testament, and Paul uses it the most. He used it in many of his letters. He used it in Romans, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, and even to his young preacher boy in the faith in 1 Timothy. And in this letter, he helped to encourage us to understand a little bit about the mystery of what he was speaking about. But if you're not sure of what he's speaking about, the easiest way is to go back to Ephesians, because Ephesians in that letter, Paul made it a little bit more clear about what he's speaking about here when he's talking about this mystery that we're seeing here in the text. Ephesians 3, verse 6 and verse 9 to help you out this morning. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Verse 9, and to bring delight for everyone, what is the plan of the mystery, hidden for ages in God who created all things? The mystery is evident. Exactly what he's speaking about is the plan of salvation for the Gentiles of the world. You know, it's interesting to think about how we think about how God orchestrated this and decided the timing to open it up for the Gentiles in the New Testament era. But when we think about that, we must always remember this, that God chooses what he wants to reveal and when he wants to reveal it. It's his sole purpose and his desire when he decides to do that in his perfect timing. Moses put it this way to make sure we understand it's not our decision, it's God's decision when he reveals things. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, he said this, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Friends, this word mystery has been revealed to us exactly what he was speaking of, how Gentiles could come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And we even notice this in the text, right? When he was speaking about them, he said, here it is, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Friends, one of the greatest mystery of the Bible is how God decided to give access to his, to the Gentiles of this world. I think about the Gentiles and Jews who can now have the same faith in Jesus Christ and how remarkable that is. And I think about why in this very moment of time that we're living, why God chose to open up to the Gentiles. And I think it this way, and I would probably understand what God was getting at, why he opened it to this, to the Gentiles to be able to have saving faith in him. Today, currently, there are more Gentile believers in Jesus Christ than there are Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. He opened it up to us. If I look around this room, I don't know, I know a lot of you, but I don't know of any of you that are Jewish. We're all Gentiles. Most of us are Gentile believers in Jesus Christ. And God decided the mystery to reveal it, that he opened up the opportunity for us to express faith in him. Why? So that those who receive Christ can be, watch this of what he says in this text, the hope of glory. Because Christ dwells within us, we are the hope of glory. And he is the hope of glory to us. Paul told the church of Corinth this, he said, we are the temple of the living God. 
As God said, I, make, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's amazing to think about how God rescues believers and that how he is the hope of glory that we have to be able to have a relationship with him for all eternity. We remember Paul's earlier statement, even in Colossians chapter 1, verse 5, the blessing to think about as we as believers profess faith in Jesus, we have the hope of heaven to be with him. Why? Because we are ministers chosen by God. We are ministers through suffering. We are ministers of the word. And we are also ministers of the mystery. But why does all this occur? It's because of the fifth point, that we are ministers with a purpose. Look at verse 28. He said, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Our purpose, like Paul's, is to proclaim Christ. The word proclaim here is an interesting word that Paul decided to use in the Greek. It's the word kata angelel. It comes from two words, and really what it means is to announce, to proclaim, to declare, to preach, or even to make known. He took two words, a preposition kata, meaning according to or down, and then he took the word angelos, which is the word messenger, or the word we get angels from. And so he, I believe he put it this way, that we need to understand our calling as chosen by God with a specific purpose to be ministers and messengers for God. That's why we exist. That's our purpose that we find in him. Now, when we think about this, he tells us that we're to proclaim him, but he also mentions two things here, one negative in nature, one positive in nature. The first is warning. The second thing is teaching. As you think about this word warning, it's the word nethetio in the Greek. It means admonish or to warn. In other words, Christ's followers are called to help admonish each other, to warn them. Not only Christ's followers, but also the people in this world. Paul told the church at Rome this in Romans chapter 15, verse 14. He said, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and are able to watch this same word, instruct one another that we have the ability to instruct to admonish to warn one another now as I think about this word in the Greek there's a new form of counseling that came out back when I was in seminary many many moons ago I learned about this form of counseling and it's called nuthetic counseling the desire to warn and admonish, to encourage, and it's a biblical form of counseling. Now, many of us will probably never be worldly counselors, but we can all take the word of God and use it to help counsel those who are in need of encouragement, of strength, of warning, of comfort, whatever that may be. We can all take part of that. I want to encourage you this morning as I help to train you to be biblical counselors to help those in need. I'm going to give you three ways to be a biblical nuthetic counselor this morning. You ready? Take notes because this is good stuff. First one is confrontation. It's on the screen for you this morning. Confrontation. Paul told the Timothy this, that the gospel is useful. The Bible is useful. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Bible is useful to warn, to confront of sin, to help us, to help others to get back on track. So what the word of God shows us. But in order to do this effectively, we also have to show some concern. You confront because there's an issue of sin, but you show concern about where they're going and where they should be going. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 tells us what Paul told the church at Corinth. He said, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as beloved children. It gets us to remember who we are. We're children of the Most High God, and so we should be concerned for each other about where we're going and the direction we're headed. To say, I'm here for you. I'm here to strengthen you and encourage you. Let me confront your sin, but yes, let me show you concern about where you're going. Get back on the right track. And number three, what is the entire desire of counseling in the first place? It's change. We counsel and we encourage people with the Bible and with God's word because we know that it can change our hearts and our lives for Jesus Christ. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 3, 8. He said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. To have life change, lasting change. Friends, we are called to help to warn and admonish each other, but we're also called to teach each other. 
This, I believe, is directly connected to what Christ told the disciples when he gave the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Our calling as believers is to teach those who are saved, is to teach the lost, is to teach everybody on this planet who God is and what he can do for them. And in turn, how we can live out our lives for him. But God gives us a clear picture of what he wants us to be as ministers. He wants us to warn people who are walking away from Christ. He wants us to teach people how they can live for Christ. He's given us a purpose to live by and to live for. I think of Aesop's fables. Many years ago, they had an Aesop fable that was the cat and Venus. Don't know if many of you have heard this one, but the story goes that there was a cat who fell in love with a man. And so the cat begged Venus to turn the cat into a woman so that he could be with the man. Well, Venus answered and said, I can do that and did it. So Venus turned the cat into a woman and the woman cat fell in love with the man and they got married. After several years, they were sitting at the table and all of a sudden a rat popped up inside their house and the cat jumped up on the table because it was a cat woman and jumped up on the table and began to chase the rat around the house. The moral of the story was that the cat could change the appearance of a cat but still had the purpose of a cat. Friends, as Christians, as followers of Christ, we have a purpose, a purpose to make God known to warn and to encourage and to teach how people can be better followers of Christ. God wants us to do that for his name's sake. We are ministers chosen by God through suffering, ministers of the word, ministers of the mystery, ministers with a purpose. Finally this morning, sixthly as we close, ministers are empowered by God. Verse 29, Paul said this to the church at Colossae, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Friends, Paul struggled for the saints. He used the word toil here, the word kapio in the Greek, it means labor, to toil, to grow tired, even to be exhausted. Paul here was on the verge of burnout. Have you ever been there? On the verge of burnout, you just give it all and you're exhausted. Some of you are like, Pastor, I'm there right now. I'm on the verge of burnout. Paul was in this very moment and he was relying on God for the strength that he needed to endure. And friends, let me tell you something. If you want the right type of power, don't rest in your own power, rest in God's power. His source of power is unlimited. And so Paul was making this statement, he's resting on his energy, on his power. And friends, we can do that today. I think of one of the best passages that reminds us of this is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 through 31, right? He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Because why? They're not resting in their own power, but friends, they are empowered by God Almighty. We are ministers of God, and we are empowered by God. Friends, let me close with some application points to your life. The first thing I want to ask you as we close is this, is are you a minister chosen by God? Have you expressed faith in Jesus Christ and adopted him as personal Lord and Savior in your life? You've turned your life over to him. If so, you are a minister chosen of God today. Secondly, are you suffering for Christ as a minister? Are you going through some struggle? Friends, I want to encourage you today, if you are, God can strengthen you as you seek to be a faithful minister for him. Third, I want to ask you the question is, are you sharing the word of God with those who are lost and even those who are found? Are you there warning and encouraging them? My wife and I had a great conversation about this this morning. We were talking about this and we were thinking about uh, Jeff Bezos, the owner and CEO of Amazon, the richest man in the world. And we thought about it this way is, you know, what if Jeff Bezos met you in person and came up to you and said, listen, you know me, I know you, and I want to do this for you. I want to give you $10,000 a month until you die. That'd be pretty sweet, right? First off, Jeff Bezos is not doing this. But if he would be, you'd be like, man, that's awesome. And then Jeff Bezos says this, and here's what I want to do for you also. Anybody that you tell about who I am and they contact me, I'll also give them $10,000 a month for the rest of their life. How many of you would go, let me pull out my phone. I'm gonna go through this whole thing. I'm gonna call everybody I know. Hey, here's free $10,000 for the rest of their lives. Pretty awesome, right? 
But friends, I think about this with us. We have an opportunity to share something that is more valuable than $10,000 for the rest of your life. It's the good news that Jesus Christ saves. Willingly, freely, offering up grace to whoever will receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Friends, we've got this thing that is more valuable than money itself, but yet what do we do with this valuable thing that we have of salvation, of the gospel? Do we take it to those who don't know? Are you sharing the word? And finally, I'd ask you this. Is there you in need of strength to do that today? Do you need some power from God Almighty? Friends, let me tell you today, here's the deal. If you would like power from God, let me tell you how to get it. You just ask for it. We know that God is a God who's faithful and just and who wants to empower his people because we are all called to be ministers of God today. Amen? And then would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you. Today, may you be glorified. May you be exalted among the heavens. God, I thank you today that you have revealed to us that we are ministers that are chosen by you. And today, you know what? Somebody in this room or somebody online says, you know what? I have never given my life to Christ and I know I'm not a minister of God right now. But today, I want to turn my life over to God. And I want to accept Christ into my life today. You can know this, that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died according to scriptures. He was buried, he rose victorious three days later so that we could have our sins forgiven, the things that we've done wrong against God and against his word. And that we can have eternal life in heaven by the grace of God that he offers to us. And today, if you want to be a minister chosen by God, you want to accept him as Lord and Savior, you can call upon his name right now to be saved. You could say something like this from your heart. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I have sinned against you. Jesus, I pray that you come into my life, that you be my Lord, my boss, and my master and my savior, and help me to be a minister for you. And if you prayed that today, I want to rejoice with you in just a moment once we're done. But all of us in this room, as we think about this passage of scripture, how we are ministers chosen by God, but we are also going to be experiencing some form of suffering. God, I pray that you'd help us as we desire to be effective ministers of the gospel, knowing we understand that we have the word of God that is much more valuable than anything in this world. And so Father, help us not only to read it, but God, to study it and apply it, and then Lord, to share it with those who need to hear. God, I pray that you'd help us to understand our purpose, our purpose to warn, our purpose to teach, our purpose to proclaim who you are. Help us to adopt that into our lives. And God, help us to know that we're not alone in that process, but that God, you are going to empower us with the strength that we need, even when we feel like we're burnt out or we're exhausted, but God, you will give us the strength to keep moving forward. And so Lord God, we exalt you today for that. May you be glorified, God, as you strengthen us as we leave this place. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray, amen. Maybe you made a decision for Jesus. Love to rejoice with you in that. I'll be up front. Uh, Love to talk to you about that. If you made a decision online, reach reach out to us at the church. Uh, We'd love to connect with you with that as well. But uh, friends, it's gonna be a great night. Wanna remind you again, 5.30, food. And then we'll have some fellowship time, six o'clock business meeting to go over some things. If you would like, we already have some copies of what we're gonna cover tonight. It's out in the foyer when you leave. There's a small table right out there. Just grab one of those packets. You can read over it for tonight. Uh, If you can or can't make it, that information's there. We'll also be live streaming it uh, on our website only for those of you who would like to participate. That will be available uh, online for you tonight. I want to also uh, remind you, don't forget, if you have any prayer requests that you would like the staff to be praying for, please make sure you write it, put it on the cross, and we would love to pray for you on Monday morning as we have our staff meetings together. But what a great day it's going to be, a lot of fun. 5.30, 6 o'clock, hopefully see you back here tonight. With that, would you rise up, have a great week, Ridgecrest. God bless.